Bill Keenest. Bill, how are you, man? Hey guys, how are you? <laughs> so good to have you back. Likewise. Good to be back. God, it's been, God, what it's been. It's been about six months since we spoke, isn't it? Pardon me? Well, I mean, it's been about six months since we last yeah. spoke on the, on the yeah. air, at least. I mean, we've been chatting a little bit in the background. It's so good to have you on. Um, You've met Bill, you have the best hat in the world on. Go Bobcats. That's right. <laughs> yes. I uh, I remind people that there was one team in the state of Ohio that played for a conference championship last Saturday. That's right. Didn't <laughs> yeah. go so well for us, but uh, our Bobcats are, are doing well. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, if they had the, the, the Rourke, the quarterback, I think they would have won. I really 100%. Agree. He's Absolutely. a great player. Yeah. So, Bill, it's so great to have you back, and you are the guy who just knows everything Lions, and you bring so much to the the conversation. Um, I could listen to you speak. I mean, the last time we we we, we talked, it was it was magical for me. I mean, I, I to take me back and think about not just you know, hey, those are great times, and it was interesting and fun, but the stories, the behind the scenes, the people, yeah. the whole thing. It's it's great. Um, let's talk. Let's just start out so people can kind of get um, acclimated to how, when we say how far back and we say way back, how far back are we going here? When did you start with the Detroit Lions? Well, I, uh, my, my first year in the NFL was 81 with Washington uh, for uh, parts of three seasons. And then I actually went back home to Pittsburgh uh, and was the PR director for the USFL team, the Maulers. Yeah. whose uh, shirt I'm <laughs> wearing today. Um, and then in 85, I had the good fortune to uh, have an opportunity to join the Lions. So 1985, uh, Dale Rogers, first year as head coach. Um, and um, it's been uh, it's been quite, an, quite a ride ever since. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now, I, I think God, that, that was did – they, did you get a car when you started? Did the Fords yeah, give you sorry? Yeah. Did the Fords give you a car when you started? Um, well, actually there was an interesting story about that. My, uh, my boss who hired me was, uh, I can't believe you asked that uh, was, was the general manager of the USFL team. Okay. Oh, right. He had been PR director of the 49ers when they won their first Super Bowl. So he was pretty, and I say this respectfully, um, and humbly, with humility, he was desperate to get me up here. Okay. He, <laughs> you know, because he was the GM in Pittsburgh and now he takes, you know, from an uh, industry standpoint, mm -hmm. a step back to become the PR director. He knew me, he saw what I had done in Pittsburgh. And, um, so I, uh, I, I was, I was interested for sure. Cause the NFL is, is the place to be by far. I was working, uh, after the USFL team uh, moved to Philadelphia, I was with the DeBartolo family, which was a great family. Yeah. And they owned the soccer team that played the indoor soccer, the Penguins, the arena. So I had some possibilities there. But he, uh, you know, he, he, he came after me hard and... You know, I was making X in Pittsburgh, and he says, "Well, we'll we'll give you ten thousand more, and you'll get a car." And I'll... So I get up here, and uh, I find out he goes, "Oh, um, I may have misrepresented some things." <laughs> <laughs> That's the last thing you want to hear salary. the first day. <laughs> I had the same salary as I had back back in Pittsburgh, and I actually, for about six months, had to share a car. Because, oh, we don't have a car for you. <laughs> it was, there was cars for the department, for the PR department. So he got one, and then I shared the other one. But uh, it was an interesting uh, interesting first year, uh, to say the least. Yeah. But uh, I will say that I, uh, uh, I obviously, I've driven a Ford every year since, and uh, I remain loyal to that brand uh, today as well. It's it's really funny because I, I I spent a period working for the company, and yeah. I've moved on to another industry and and whole different world. And yeah. I buy to this day. I, I buy Ford yeah. products. I have friends that work there still, and it's this this. Yeah. It's like I really like the BMW. It's a nice nice yeah. car, but I, I my people right in my home. Right. It's 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 sure. the thing. I, um, that's where I'm at. 
my, my father grew up in that era and I'm sure you can relate to this when, when people, families, men were very loyal to a specific brand yeah. Yeah. of automobile. I mean, it was a GM, it was Chevy, it was Chrysler, it was Dodge, it was Buick or Ford. My father never drove a Ford until I got here. And then he was, that's all he drove because, and what it was about was what you said, loyalty, yep. you know, that that's something that I, I think we've lost some of in every aspect. Um, but if I, if I can tell you one, one final story about the, the Ford factor. So my first year again, 85, we are playing a game in Tampa and I am advancing the game back then the PR staff, would go five days early, take care of the hotel, the airport, the buses, the equipment, truck, all that stuff. So um, the uh, the business office at the Lions would make the arrangements for me. So I get to Tampa and I go to pick up my rental car that I'm going to have for the week and the car that I am going to drive onto the tarmac to meet the team plane when it comes in on Saturday. And... Uh, it happened to be a GM. I'm like, I'm thinking how in the world did our people not reserve me a Ford? I mean, I'm, I'm like flabbergasted. And I said, I can't drive that. What do you mean? I go, well, I need a Ford. We don't have any. So I was stuck. It's my first year. I'm a young guy. Oh no. What I did is I took it and then I, I used the photocopier and logos. I mean, this is silly that I reproduced the Ford Oval and taped it over anywhere on the vehicle where there was the GM symbol. (laughs) That is hardcore. Sure that when the plane got there on Saturday that no one could see what kind of car it was. All they saw was the Ford emblem. And people laughed at me, but I did what I did. So (laughs) it seemed to work out for you. Yeah, it did. Goodness. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I, I, I got to ask this, and this, this goes back to very early in your career, because yeah. this is something I, I'm a little young for this, but I remember watching Chuck Long yeah. at Iowa in college. And I, I was I was in middle school at that point. And I'm like, this guy's incredible. Why didn't he work out? Like, I've never I've never understood that. And, and yeah. I didn't know football well enough at that time to process it. Just was there something physical, I, mechanical, mental what was up with that? Well, I, I have a, a pretty strong opinion of that because um, Chuck's a wonderful guy. And I think his career with the Lions could be easily explained, at least from my perspective. Okay. So he's the the, the top pick. Um, I lost you guys. Yeah, we got you. You're still here for us. You're, okay. you're, you're, you're good. Okay. Um, so he's, he's the top pick. Um and in uh, 86, he doesn't sign till late, okay, in training camp. Mm-hmm. Um, back then, uh, we didn't have, uh, the league didn't have a rookie wage scale. Right. right um, right, so right. players held out. He got in late, almost too late to get, you know, into the rotation. Um, and Eric Kippel was a starter that year. So Chuck doesn't play until an, another game in Tampa in December, all right? And I don't know if either of you know the, the uh, Jeopardy answer to the trivia question that uh, Chuck is a part of regarding his first game in Denver. No, Anybody? I don't, no. I don't, no. The very, the very first pass he threw as an NFL player was a touchdown to Leonard Thompson. He got put in the game late, and he threw a – I want to say it was 37, 38, 39 yards. I could be wrong on that. Down the uh, the left sideline to Leonard Thompson. And uh, so you can imagine the excitement that went along with that. We got our quarterback. Okay. 87, and here's, my, here's where my opinion comes in. 87 in training camp. Um, you know, he starts out pretty darn well. And then we, we have a strike 
We have the uh, I remember that strike in '87, um, and we miss a total of four games. He did. The veterans did. The first game of the strike was the Bears uh, at the Silverdome, which would have been our only sellout of that year, unfortunately, because that game was canceled. So the league only played 15 games that year. And then we had the three replacement games. And then he came back, and it just wasn't the same. I mean, he's a young guy. He's, you know, trying to win a starting job. And and it just that layoff, I think, really, really hurt him. I really do. So the rest of the season was pretty disjointed. We won five games that year. The following year, um, uh, we go to Wisconsin for training camp. I'm not sure if if you guys remember that we went up there. I don't remember that. Yeah, we went up there one year and and. Uh, I think we I think we uh, scrimmaged against the uh, the Saints. I didn't go because I was waiting on the birth. Or I, I just had my first child. We had our first child, so I was able to stay back and deal with that. Um, but it was up in I think Lacrosse, Wisconsin, one of those D three schools up there. And what I remember about that experience from afar was. It was historically hot and humid, oppressively so. And that year, 88, ended up being Daryl Rogers' last season with the Lions. Yep. Okay. Yep. And I think Daryl put a saddle on Chuck beginning the first day of camp and just rode him. And the the word, my recollection is the word was Chuck took almost every rep. I mean, his arm was practically dead by the time that camp. Yeah, it was it was unfair to him. But Daryl, you know, he he had a decent first year, a terrible second year, and he knew that this was going to be a pivotal year for him. So he wanted to, you know, saddle up with the young buck quarterback. And I think Chuck and Chuck's arm uh, was affected by it. He got a he got a sore arm, a tired arm that year. And then, as you recall. Uh, Daryl gets fired. Uh, Wayne takes over as an interim coach. And then who does Wayne hire uh, during his interim process? Miles Davis. Yeah. The run and shoot. I remember. I love the run and shoot. <laughs> yeah. And so what happens is, um, you know, Miles had his idea of what a run and shoot quarterback should be or shouldn't be. Um, you want somebody with a little bit probably more mobility than Chuck had. Chuck had great pocket presence. He wasn't a, a burner when it came to, you know, scrambling. But uh, it just sort of trickled downhill from there as far as Chuck goes. Uh, you know, we had uh, we, we drafted Barry the next year. Bob Galliano was on the roster, someone that Miles liked a lot for the run and shoot. And uh, Rodney <laughs> Pete was drafted. So I think Chuck Long's career journey could have been a lot different if it weren't for some things that he he really didn't have much control over so that's my that's my thought on chuck i think that probably happens with a lot of players that we don't necessarily realize that there's a lot going on no around just what's going on with it yeah. no question i think that is so accurate and um you know play i i could even say the same thing about oops we got you still. Yeah, you're yeah. good, Bill. <laughs> I uh, I could say the same thing, and this will probably shock you about Andre Ware, because Andre was drafted in '90. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Miles the second year. Yep. Um, and he holds out the entire entire training camp. Yep. Um, the uh, Lee Steinberg, and I could go into stories about that too if you want it someday. <laughs> um, how that thing evolved. I want all the stories, Bill. You know that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, there's some good ones. Lee, Lee Steinberg still holds the uh, the annual party every year. I get an invite to it. I haven't gone at the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> yep. The, uh, I'll share this with you. So Lee has Andre, you know, the run and shoot NCAA record setting quarterback from the University of Houston, and. There was this image of Lee, and I give Lee credit. He did a remarkable job cultivating the media, not necessarily all with factual information, okay? <laughs> but, it, but it worked, okay? 
so Lee had this, this, you know, reputation. I mean, it was, it was his billboard, so to speak. Lee Steinberg has never had a number one pick that held out a training camp that didn't sign on time. And he had like, you know, I don't know how many number ones. I mean, it goes back to my USFL days with Steve Young. Remember? Yeah. yeah. Remember yep. Sports Illustrated, the $40 million yeah. quarterback? Yeah. That Absolutely. was about a $4 million annuity. That's what that was. <laughs> that wasn't. But, but Sports Illustrated, right. that's what that was. That's all the money that was spent on that. But we got the cover of Sports Illustrated, the gold standard sports journal of its time to uh, to put that on the cover so anyways um so we have we have uh andre ware and lee's his agent i did a little i i, I did my due diligence as a pr guy right? <laughs> and i uncovered and this was astonishing um that his whole mo and, and mantra about not having anybody ever miss the first day of camp ever hold out all that he had seven number one picks that technically, by the definition of what he was trumpeting, wasn't true. That 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 weren't there on the first day. That missed up to weeks. Okay. Now it was a different world back then. You didn't have Twitter and social media and all the instant ability to correct things or refute things. Right, right. So I went into uh Chuck Schmidt, who was handling the contract at the time. And I says, Chuck, hey, just in case you want, you need this info or you want this info or you want me to get this info out maybe to some media, here's the facts. And I had it all documented. Well, we and I, I, I gave that to a few members of the media just so they knew the truth. And it was like I lit the fuse, man. Lee was not a happy guy. <laughs> Lee probably did not take that very well. <laughs> yeah, he was exposed, right? <laughs> so the uh, the one thing I remember, and I would always do this back in that era, I, I would usually know what our offer was, our initial offer, um, and, and what the agents were asking for. And, you know, Mr. Ford didn't want – one thing about him, he didn't want us to play games, make a fair, solid offer. Let's get this guy in, get him signed. And what I remember was what we had legitimately offered initially or real early where we could have got him in for training camp ended up being only a hundred thousand dollars in total from where he signed. Whereas what they were asking for was millions away from where they signed. So I think the way we approached it was eminently fair. Now, the other thing I'll share with you. So it's the last week of training camp. Lee's in the office meeting with Chuck, trying to get it done. I get a call from Chuck. Oh, about um, maybe five, I don't know, late afternoon, 530 or so. And he asked me to come down the office and they're in a conference room and God bless Lee Steinberg. I, I, I mean, I don't know how he how he did it, or maybe he still does it. But he's sitting at a at a desk with about eighteen diet cokes, three or four cans of snuff. You know, he's he's wired. Right? He's wired. And uh, we exchanged pleasantries, um, even though that that issue with the you don't have all your guys in on time still was a, the black cloud sort of lingering over us. Um, and Chuck said, I think we're going to have a deal. we got a deal basically. And, and we're working on getting the, the I's dotted and the T's crossed. And I go, that's great. And Chuck asked me, he says, uh, what do you think about a press conference? And I had told Chuck at the beginning, here's the thing with Lee. He's the master of the manipulation of the media. So when we get a deal, we're going to announce it. I don't care if it's two in the morning. I mean, facetiously, but we're not going to wait for him to scoop us because he will. That's the reality. We all know that. Um, certainly today that happens all the time. But so I, so Chuck looked at me and I said, um, Oh, I, we'll get it done tonight. I'll get it. You tell me when I can go and we'll, and Lee goes, Oh no, no, no. Let's wait till tomorrow. We don't want it. It's late. Andre's actually on his way in Thank you. Uh, on a flight. He's coming in. So, and I said, no, 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 we can get it done tonight. We'll have it at 10 o'clock. 
you know, we'll get all the 11 o'clock live shots, blah, blah, blah. We'll take care of everybody. And I'm looking at Chuck like, remember what I said, you know, Chuck. <laughs> and then, and then Chuck goes, and then he did. And he goes, if you can get it done tonight, we're going to have it tonight. And I go, we can get it done. We're going to do it at 10 o'clock. So I leave my, and go to my office and get my staff ready and blah, blah, blah. And then, uh, Chuck calls me again and it's about, I don't know, quarter to seven, maybe. And he said, Hey, you want to go get a sandwich? Lee and I are going up to the corner restaurant or whatever, the Coney or whatever it was, just to get some dinner. And I said, sure, I'll go with you. So I, I walked down to Chuck's office and we're just getting up to leave. And Lee goes, you know, I think I'm going to stay here. I got some calls to make. You could bring me a sandwich or something. And we're walking from Chuck's office to mine. And I'm like, Chuck, <laughs> he, he just got us. What do you mean? I go, let's go back into my office. So we go back into my office. It was a couple minutes before seven o'clock. I turn on ESPN and breaking news out of Pontiac, Michigan, the Lions and Andre Ware have come to an agreement. And I'm like, oh, man. He got you. So he got us. So that's why he's still doing what he's doing, probably. He uh, he knew the business. He knew, um, you know, how to be strategic. And uh, by all accounts, he's still doing a great job with it. So anyways. Let me ask you: Do you are you do you ever speak with uh, Joey Harrington anymore? You know what? I don't. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't spoke with Joey for a long time. Um, I know we talked about his uh, TED talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. so inspirational, yeah. and uh, that was pretty revealing. Um, you know, to be a quarterback in the NFL takes so much, and I think where Joey was in Oregon, he was a favorite son in so many ways. Um, and to come to a place that was just dying for the savior, so to speak, at that position, I think it was hard on him. And, uh, you know, he had, I, I, I think I told you, Chris, the last time, the first game he started his rookie year against Green Bay went right down to the end. Yep, yep, and he yep. threw a ball down the seam to Michael Ricks. Remember him? Yeah. yeah. You know, the receiver yep. turned tight end. Yep. And it was literally inches off his fingertips and we would have won that game the next week we're playing new orleans and if you watch the tape of him you'd have thought oh my goodness this guy is going to be around for 10 12 years and have you know playoffs and who knows what but um it just didn't happen it just didn't happen with joey yeah yeah, that's it's sad. it's sad. And his TED talk to me was just so revealing. It's the, yeah. the pressure that comes on a man. And yeah. that's one of the things, even like in, in, in today's world with Jared Goff, I, I and we talked about it yeah. this morning when we had Justin Rogers from the Detroit News on, that we I really want to see folks be able to separate the man from the athlete, from the game a lot more, because there is so much more to that. Now, yeah. it, it you get it. Jared's dealing with that right now. I mean, you go back to Matthew Stafford. And I know you were very close with the Stafford family. Yeah. It was a little bit of different there because he yeah. he was the hero. He was the shining star and Megatron for a while, but he was the guy on the team yeah. that carried so much and was the shining hope for so long. Mm -hmm. But um, what's what's some of your favorite Matthew Stafford stories? Because he's he he's got a great sense of humor. He, he's a quirky yeah. guy, but you don't see it a whole lot out. In the, in, yeah. in the world, right? <laughs> well, I I go back to, as you will both remember, when he was drafted, we had Dante Culpepper on the roster. Yep. And, um, and there was a pretty strong sentiment um, from the media and the fans through the media, through talk radio and this and that. Um, you know, you can't ruin this guy. You can't put him out there as a rookie, you know. There was that, yeah, yep. that sort of unwritten rule, you know, let the rookie rest the first year, let him learn, let him watch, blah, blah, blah. Um, you don't want to get him shell-shocked. You don't want to ruin the kid. And I laughed at that. I laughed at that because here I'm thinking, this kid, I say affectionately, <laughs> started as a freshman at one of the biggest high school programs in Texas. And I had the, the good fortune 
uh, by comparison, having a son that played quarterback at Oxford, which was a fo- which is a football crazy town. Right, right. And I remember telling my son before his first start, you know, you're never going to have the pressure you have now because of your age, because of your your you know sort of foundation that's just being built. And you know, at that age, you got classmates, you got teammates, you got your neighbors, everybody knows. So that's what Joey, or that's what uh, Matthew went through at, in Texas at Highland Park as a 14 year old. Yeah. And then he goes to Georgia and he starts as a true freshman in the SEC. <laughs> you know, <laughs> think about that before 80,000 fans, yeah. you know, in Tuscaloosa or, you know, and I'm, I'm laughing at people here because I truly believed that the pressure he would have to start that first game will be, it'll be there. But if you could measure it, it ain't close to what he went through in high school or college. And you know what? Matthew was wired, man. He was wired perfectly, in my opinion, for that position. Did he get mad? Did he have? Yeah, he's human. But he was the kind of guy that just you have to have amnesia in that position. Quarterback and cornerback, you have to have amnesia. Forget that play and move on to the next or that play will will destroy you that, you know, figuratively that play. And, um, and Matthew from day one was just, you know, and then, and then of course that, that rookie year we had, uh, you know, the great, you know, NFL films wire and all that for the, the Browns game. Um, I'll never forget the look on his face. I'm sorry. I'll never forget the look on his face when he's looking at his shoulder, like, yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if I told Chris this the last time, but the funny thing about that um, is films has the right to wire a quarterback every season, the head coach, the quarterback. So it's Matthew's first year they come to me in training camp to try to pick a date. And of course, what I want as the PR guy I want the best game possible, right? Right, right. I want a game. Remember, the year before, we didn't win a game. <laughs> so I want a game that we have a good chance to yeah, win, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> so they threw out a game early, and I said, nah, that's a little too early. I might have came up with some excuses. And then we had we had a game picked uh, halfway through the season. And the week before, Kelvin got hurt. So Monday, now films – probably has all the flights because they bring a crew to yeah, the stadium yeah, yeah. and set up cameras and everything um, in addition to what the network has. So Calvin gets hurt. And I, I think I went to our trainer, Dean Kleinschmidt, and I said, Dean, is there any chance Calvin? No, he's not going to play next week. I go, okay. So I call films and I go, uh, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to uh, reschedule Matthew. What do you mean? We got to reschedule him. This is the second time. I go, I know, uh, but we're not going to wire him Sunday. Why? Because we're not. I just, I, I <laughs> believed in my head and heart that this this was not the game we won. So looking ahead, we finally, or I finally, however, uh, suggested, why, why don't we do Cleveland? Because <laughs> they had a young quarterback, Brady Quinn, right? Right. right. And uh, it was obviously at home and blah, blah, blah. So we finally settled on Cleveland, and uh, the rest is history, as they say. Yeah. Um, wow. But what I was going to tell you, so that was the game before Thanksgiving, right? Yep. And he had a separated shoulder, you know, the whole deal. Um, and so I go to the – I always spent the night before the home games at the team hotel. So I think we were at the um, – West and downtown, I think that's where we stayed back then. And I get to the hotel, and Schwartzy calls me over, and Jim goes, uh, "I think Matthew's going to try to play tomorrow." And I'm like, "What?" And and then I go into a ballroom, and and my recollection now is he's in there throwing, because you know, because it was his left shoulder that was hurt, right, not his right, right throwing arm. Right. And then the next morning we get to uh, Ford Field and Jim has me find an area that's private because he doesn't want to 
anybody to take a picture or film of it. And we go to a storage area off the tunnel um, and Matthew's in there throwing. But to me, that was just guts. That was grit. Whatever you want to call it, that was adrenaline. And he tells Jimmy he can start. And I don't know if you remember, but uh, the first drive of the game, he took the team right down the field. (laughs) And we scored. Incredible. Uh, but but he couldn't he couldn't continue. It was it was too serious an injury. But that was Matthew Stafford. You know, I'm going to do everything I can, however I can, to help my teammates, to help my team. Um, and uh, yeah, you that's know, how you win winning. over Detroit. That's 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 winning the fans over yeah. right there. No, you're right, Jeff. I mean that that personified the people, and it showed them. Hey, we may not be, you know, X, Y, or Z, but we got heart and and we're going to give you everything we have, everything we have. And there wasn't a day that Matthew Stafford didn't do that uh, for the Lions or for the people or the fans uh, of this city. I want to ask you real quick. Chris Spielman is my football hero. I grew up in yeah. Northeast Ohio. Oh, okay. Do you have any, any, any story you can share about Chris that just – or, or – different or, or off the beaten path or I, I remember a production meeting his rookie year and we're playing uh, the Rams in LA as I recall and the former Rams or, or uh, the former SC coach I think it, and then he became the Rams coach Johnny Robinson okay yeah. Uh, was doing some color for for CBS at the time. And they want to talk to Chris. They want to talk to Spillman. So they bring him in the production meeting. And he and Johnny John are talking, you know, football, this, that, and the other. And Chris says, well, when they're in this formation, um, look for this, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I remember Chris leaving the meeting. He said, man, that's pretty, that's pretty impressive for a rookie. Um, so wouldn't you know, and to, to Johnny's credit, to John's credit, you know, it's during the game and the Rams offense gives this look and John goes, now, Chris, we had, we talked to Chris Spillman and he told us blah, blah, blah. And it happened exactly how Spillman pr- predicted it would. And he made the tackle and Johnny, I think was the happiest guy in the state. He was, I told you, I told you, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. so Chris, Chris, uh, Definitely had that that intuitiveness and that football football intelligence, football character that you look for, and uh, and his career certainly spoke to that. Here we go. All right, Love Bill. <laughs> I mean, I could I could literally talk to you for the entire twenty four hours. We've got going here, and you know that. I mean, we've, yeah, we we will talk more. We will talk yeah, more. I hope so. Yeah, we've got a lot yeah. of time, and I know I know we've both been dragged around yeah. with the the world, the regular you know real life stuff lately. But sure. um, the 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 horizon opens up for us. Let's get together some more. Let's talk some more okay. because these stories are absolute gold. I mean, I you it. are an, a wealth it, of some of the most amazing information. Yeah. Bill, it's fun, Bill. I appreciate your time. And, and I, re- I mean, before we met, I always, I was like, who is that guy? He's always in the damn camera shot. No matter where we are. <laughs> I had a lot of grief for that. Believe me. Yeah. Oh man. Bill Keenest. I mean, forever with the lions, a guy he's, he's got a memory, the perfect, you were the lions historian for, for ages and, and the perfect guy for the role. Not only were you there in the room for all these things, but mm-hmm. you have an absolute steel trap of a memory to be able to recall yeah. all these fine de- details. Bill, you have been perfectly placed and I appreciate you spending time with us, uh, telling some stories and, and we're going to, we're going to get into a lot more. We're, we're going to talk about the USFL at some point, Bill, because oh, I did my boy. senior history thesis at OU on the USFL. Yeah. So we, we're going to have a conversation sometime, my friend. That would be wonderful, Jeff. I'd really enjoy that. Awesome. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Keenest. Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate you. And uh, I'll, 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 I'll contact you the next couple of days. <laughs> All right. I love the guys. That's thank awesome. you right. very much. Love you too, Bill. Thank you, man. Thank you, Bill. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Wow. All right. Bill Keenest. That's, uh, that's impressive. Yeah.